5, 7, that's 1 John 5 and verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. Who are they? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Everybody shout it. And these three are one. And there are three, verse 8, that bear witness in earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Praise God. These three are one. And there is a threefold and tripartite, as we say, tripartite. There are tripartites everywhere, three parts. Uh, in the, if you analyze water, if you analyze uh, trees, if you analyze uh, uh, the atmosphere, the universe, you can find the tripartites everywhere. But God is not just, uh, I don't want to use the word tripartite because the word part is there. God is not in three parts. God, our God, is three in persons, not three in parts, not three parts. Our God is one God eternally existing, coexisting in three persons or three hypostases with E at the end, which shows plural, three hypostases, three hypostases. So that's uh, three in person, uh, one in essence. So our God is the triune God and uh, the word there used in Colossians uh, 2, um, Nine that shows that uh, all of the Godhead is in Christ Jesus bodily, bodily. And the Lord Jesus uh, is saying uh, in, uh, in the Gospel of John chapter 14 and verse 23, if, you, if we love the Word of God and we remain, we abide in Him and His Word, the Father and the Son him will come and make their abode in us. And then we read from 1 Corinthians 3.16, 2 Corinthians uh, 6.16, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 19, uh, 1 Corinthians, again, uh, in different parts, we read uh, that he has made us the temples of the Holy Spirit. So we are the temples of the Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son came where the Holy Spirit is. So the triunity of God lives in us. Not uh, speaking ontologically, and there is no God out there. It only means that through His preeminence and through His um, uh, o o omniscience and om om o omnipresence, He's everywhere uh, and uh, in Christ Jesus. And again, uh, let's go to um, what we mentioned about uh, Colossians. Colossians 2 verse 9. Colossians 2 9, For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. Godhead is the word. Bodily, only if theotis, theotis, theotis. So we see the biblical word for our triune God, all of the Godhead. The Godhead is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So listen to this now. The next verse right after says, and ye are 
complete in him, Christ Jesus, which is the head of all principality and power. So we are complete in him. In Christ, we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. In Christ, if we love his word and abide in his word, let us go there also. John, the gospel of John 14, 23, to read it exactly as it is and, uh, and quote the scripture. Uh, first, that is the gospel of John chapter 20, uh, 14, verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Our abode with him. Amen. The Lord said in Genesis 1, 27, he says, let us make man in our image, after our image and in our image and after our likeness. Our, our, amen. The Mormons or the witnesses will say our speaks to the angels. But Elohim is not referring there about the angels. It refers to Within the Godhead, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the three in one, our abode in Him. Let us make man after our image. We are not after the image of angels. We are after the image of God Almighty. Amen. So praise the Lord for that. Now, we are talking, we are going back to uh, a subject in the general category of theology, studying the nature of God and getting to know God closer. This is so exciting because, dear brothers and sisters, it's not something just about God. We are finding the very essence of God. And let me tell you that the Christian church needs to study theology in the biblical sense because we are the right people to do theology. Not the unbelievers, not the students at the liberal universities, but the born-again believers that they study the Word of God. And unfortunately, most of the believers are just illiterate about the subjects of who God is. And they're easily... That's why uh, the cults of Mormons and the witnesses and the like, 80% of them are taken out of evangelical churches. Why? Because they lure them with different, with uh, using uh, other means, supposedly philosophical or logical, and they try to understand with human logic so they cannot explain the, the Trinity. Uh, we cannot either but we are going to see what the Word of God uh, says about His oneness and His threeness. His threeness in being three in person, he, His oneness in being one in essence. He's one God, one in essence, Theotis, Godhead, Godhead. We are filled. We don't need anything else. We don't need anybody else. We are filled to the Trinity of God. So we want to know the Trinity of God. And that's why our approach is not to explain it away with logical means, but to believe it as the Bible teaches it. It is still a mystery. We are not here to explain the mystery. We are here to uh, preach the mystery and believe it as it is. Otherwise, if we could understand God, then we, uh, he would stop uh, being God anyway. So we believe in the living God. Now, we, we are under the umbrella of the subject of theology, and the subject is the doctrine. Not simply these words, the simplicity of God. The simplicity of God doesn't speak about God being simple, as uh, I explained uh, um, some time ago. It means that 
ontologically, there is uh, the simplicity of God taught, and it was an accepted matter. Listen to this very carefully. By since the first church, even west and we, uh, east and west, in between them, uh, Orthodox, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Catholic, uh, Protestants, Armenians, Calvinists, uh, everybody believed that uh, for 19 centuries until the cults came through liberalism. So it is a subject that unites us in God. And it is a subject that will protect us from error and, uh, and cultish teaching. So we believe in one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor separating the substance. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, yet not three gods, but one God e eternally coexisting in three persons this is part of the so-called Athanasian Creed. And uh, we, we don't believe just because Athan Athanasius um, uh, introduced it. He just confirmed what the Bible had taught since the first century. Amen. And also the ecumenical councils, don't be intimidated by th that term. On, do not let anybody intimidate you. With, with the, these uh, terms uh, about uh, the councils of the church and who was the church, uh, the church was the apostolic church of the apostles and prophets being, uh, uh, the Lord Jesus being the chief cornerstone, cornerstone um, that's Ephesians 2.12, we are built on the foundations of the, uh, of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. This is who we are. This is the church since the first century. Do not let anybody intimidate you with numbers. Numbers always led to perdition. But it was always God worked with the faithful remnant. And uh, um, part of um, uh, the whole teaching is to also uh, let you know that the church has been and has kept the, the, the word of God as we know it since the first century. And we know that in facts. And as I promised, I will give you written material that shows that throughout the centuries, um, everything is there, including this verse, that they fight the most which is Trinitarian uh, verse. So we are teaching about the simplicity of God. This is a doctrine of the church. All of the branches of the church, listen to this. Orthodox does not mean Eastern Orthodox religion. In the same way, uh, Catholic doesn't mean Roman Catholic. The words Catholic, firstly, means all over the world, all over the earth, all over the world. And then the word orthodox means uh, this is the right uh, thinking and believing, right believing about God. Okay, so uh, orthodox teaching means this is the classical Christianity, orthodox teaching teaching is that's why I insist of being known as a church classical Christianity we have Pentecostal theology very clearly uh, but we, we classify ourselves as, as classical Christianity we are to teach classical Christianity and stay within orthodoxy meaning the right beliefs that they were kept preserved by God and his church throughout the years. So by saying this, uh, again, we are not saying God is simple uh, to analyze. It, it is one of the most complex subject to do so. But uh, 
it means God is one. And uh, what mainly means is that God uh, is, does, is not composed by parts. He's not composite. He is simple, meaning he is not uh, uh, the, ho- the, the total, the sum total of the parts or forms. So God does not consist, consist of parts. And uh, I will explain more, but we are going to get um, right into it. First, I would like to show this diagram about the Trinity. That's uh, an illustration. Not an illustration like the egg we gave that they teach children. That it, it, is, um, it is the heart, uh, it, it is the outside of the, the, the egg, it is the white and the, uh, and, and the yellow, uh, the three parts of the egg or water um, in different forms. Uh, these are not good examples. Uh, there cannot be a good example about the Trinity because, because of the doctrine of the simplicity of God, meaning God is one and... Uh, he uh, exists in a, uh, and he is, the word exist uh, really means being under, uh, and God is not under anyone, anyone. so uh, God is the great I am. You can say I am, I can say I am, but we are because somebody is our earthly Father and earthly mother, and we've been born into a family. That's why I can say I am because I was born. But I have to trace this back because uh, the only being, as a good theologian said it, is that God, um, God is the only being. All of us are becomings. So we become uh, because somebody was the reason. So you can cause every being, every being has its um, cause in another being, but God is the uncaused cause. Amen? He's the one who is the cause for everything, and he's uncaused. He, you cannot uh, find who caused God. And that's what the simplicity of God is, that God is. And he is uh, in a dimension in and by himself. He doesn't need any parts to be because he is without parts and without having to be because he is the verb to be. He is the very essence of life. Now, the only good, but this is a diagram. This is not uh, an illustration uh, that we are saying the Trinity is like that. This is a, a, a way to say what the Bible says. So, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, the Son, clockwise, if we take, uh, if we take, if we take it from uh, the circle, we, you, we see that the Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Son. These are three distinct persons. Amen? So, but at the same time, if we go into the triangle, we see in the center that we see God. God is there. God is is there, the triune God. So the Son is, if you go inside the, the triangle, the Son is God, the Father is God, the Spirit is God, but on the circle, the Father is not the Spirit, neither the Son nor the Son is the, is the Father or the Spirit. But the three are one. We take exactly what the Bible says, 
three bear witness in heaven the father the word the, the word the logos and the spirit and these three are one okay and and these three are one these three are one what do we believe about our god and as a church uh, uh, is that god the god we serve is both transcended and imminent uh, not imminent his coming is imminent but he's imminent with a i m m a and this means i will explain it because it's not just words they are theological words of course you you can find it in, in the dictionaries uh, you can find it under the 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 subject of philosophy uh, greek philosophers and uh, all, all of this <laughs> there is another there is another greek philosopher of the uh, fifth uh, century uh, before christ and and uh, his name is empedocles empedocles and this one uh, was into all kinds of things um, even modern writers like Costis Palamas and others wrote about him and they referred to him that he was into um, into the occult apocryphismos and into magic and into he himself was saying that he was a devil a demon and because of a big sin he became a man and he expects to become God again I mean nonsense but all of those philosophers they used terms that you can find uh, when we use them in the in the in the subject of theology they use them uh, explaining them in their own terms in occulticism in greek philosophy and all of the other things we are taking what is biblical and separating between what is orthodox the right teaching and what is not so when we say transcended we are not talking about uh, transcendental uh, meditation uh, this has to do with buddhism confucianism and uh, eastern philosophy so don't confuse that uh, we are talking about our god the transcended god transcended means beyond 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 and where is the confusion between the living god and the false gods the real god that is standing alone as god notice that our god is not a god one of the many our god is god almighty amen uh, nobody is there to help him who he is he is who he is because he is who he is that's all amen but his transcendent means he's beyond i mean he is not restricted uh, or he's not restricted by time by space by material uh, things or walls or anything in the physical that's why uh, sometimes they call these things metaphysical from the greek word after or beyond so trans transcended is beyond is beyond and to to tell you the truth only our god is really beyond the beyond magic and occulticism and all of uh, these new age uh, philosophies are trying to get into uh, outside of the restrictions of time and space they do get into the spiritual but they get into the wrong spiritual and they are slaves like empedocles who was saying he was a demon and he will become god i mean what the devil said empedocles said also now i know greeks who love their philosophers will say but he said so many good things i don't disagree with anybody with what he says just for the sake of disagreeing if they said good things good for them 
if they said good things about God, good for them. But uh, what they said and what they've been representing, I totally disagree. And I, uh, we are here to present the living God. And uh, the living God is the one that we can have relationship with. And the simplicity of God uh, uh, within the framework of these two words that I, would would tell, I, I just told you, God is transcended, means He is beyond. He is beyond. They go beyond the physical people in occultism and in the occult and into uh, magic and all of these efforts to try to search what is beyond and they get enslaved. They get into spiritual, but it's demonic. But our God is beyond the beyond. Our God is the one who can uh, be in the past eternity. Our God is Psalms 90 verse 2. Thou art God from everlasting to everlasting. All the others are created. Even though it can, can be spiritual creatures, yet were created. Our God stands alone in his grace and power and mercy. And we shall see uh, what it means. Our God is beyond. You see, that's why when we praise God, we say, uh, Our God, you are above, beyond. He even sees the future. He is even called the father of the future. He is known as the counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace, the one who knows the future. Hallelujah. Praise God. Do you believe that? God knows the future. So whatever kind of a book they tried to introduce, and say you should read that book, that sacred book, just ask them. Just tell me one prophecy that came true. The Word of God is filled with prophecies and describes the future in the pages of Scripture within the framework of 15 to 1600 years apart, 1500 to 1600 years. From the beginning to the end, and it includes the past beyond that and the future, touching our day in the future beyond. This is the Word of God. Uh, let's go to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us... A son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end, verse 7, upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The Lord of hosts. It means exactly Yehovah Tzavot, the Lord of the armies. The Lord of the armies. And he's the Lord of the armies because he is the omnipotent God, the Lord who is able to do anything, everything. This is showing the simplicity of God. The power of God is the same now and forever. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10 to see the transcendent God. He's the everlasting Father. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Uh, now, he's the only one who can do that. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do my pleasure. Wow. Who else can say that? And even if there was one amongst the many so called gods of this world, of prophets or of this world who could say my counsel shall stand and I will do my pleasure 
Let them do their pleasure. Let's go to Psalms 82, verse 6. Please. Let's see what kind of gods are the gods of this world. Uh, Psalms 82, verse 6. Please. Psalms 82. I have said, ye are gods. Does that make us gods? I explained it many times. And all of you are children of the Most High. Verse 7 explains 6. God's Elohim there refers to those in authority because the word Elohim was used for magistrates and those in authority, especially the judges. You are people of authority, yet doesn't make you God. And we see in, this, in these lessons, we will differentiate between the living God and those others who have any kind of authority. But ye shall die, ye shall, uh, die like men. What, what are you? you? You are men and fall like one of all the princes. You're men. You may be princes, but all of you fall and die. But the one God that we know, He's the transcendent one. He is absolutely different than anyone else because He is who He is. And the word immanent, the word immanent means He is God. Who is not just out there, he's involved, he's present. It, 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 it means literally he's there. You know, one of his names is Yahweh Shema. The Lord is there. Where? There. There. Where? Just point. He's there. Not only physically speaking, but where we are in need in our life. He's there. He's there. Before we came into this problem, the, the Lord is already there to give us the victory because we see beyond the situations, we see the one who is able to shake everything because he can tell the end from the beginning and he will do as he pleases. And he pleases to set us free. Amen. God is actively involved. How do we know that? Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 talks about God will give you another sign. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel. God, it means God with you. Let's go to Matthew 1 23, 1 21, and then 123. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. It says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name, his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Here is the fulfillment of of Isaiah 7:14 and verse 23 behold a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us so is his name Jesus or Emmanuel his name you shall call Jesus, but Jesus is Emmanuel, and it's the fulfillment of Emmanuel. He is God with us. God with us. So he is God transcendent, and he is God immanent. He's there. That's part of the course of the simplicity of God. We'll get into it deeper and deeper, and I love it. I get to know my God better. Hallelujah in His power. Hallelujah.